Good. Yeah. 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 So my name is Ben Hall. I am the founder of Katakoda. Katakoda is an interactive learning platform for software developers. We teach awesome things like Docker, Kubernetes, OpenShift, um, and, and generally all of the amazing tools which you have been hearing about today. So if you want to know more, you can go to katakoda.com and um, learn for free in an interactive way. My lovely co-host tonight is... Hello, my name is Andrew Martin. Uh, I'm a little bit of dev, a little bit of ops, a little bit of test, which I believe in passionately. And uh, today is uh, the outing of uh, mine and my friend Luke Bond's new consultancy, Control Plane. So with any luck, this will demonstrate uh, some technical know-how. If it falls appallingly flat on its face, please don't find that indicative of the quality of the work the Control Plane <laughs> will continue to do in the future. <coughs> Yes, um, likewise. Um, so the, kind of the reason this talk came up is because Andrew and I are constantly kept awake at night about the dangers of our applications on the internet. Every day, people are looking around trying to find exploits, trying to find weaknesses, or just generally trying to cause disruption um, by sending like uh, DDoS attacks and making things like Google slow down um, <laughs> by ping requests. Um, and so it's a really dangerous time for our applications online. But thankfully, we have containers, and containers will contain everything. Or that's kind of what we're led to believe, or at least that's what I hope today. That's what I, I hope that's true. And so um, we got speaking, and it was like, well, I've deployed various different things onto the internet over time, and it would be really great now that Andrew's launched his new company, and he's also a certified Kubernetes administrator, <laughs> and he's got all of these capabilities, if he could just do a quick audit on my system and just see what's happening. Another little kind of carrot, if he does manage to break out, then maybe, just maybe, he can capture a Bitcoin, which I think the current price is about $4,500 or something. Lovely. Now, remember that Bitcoin can be broken into many smaller dimensions, so <laughs> we can't guarantee it's a whole Bitcoin, but there may be some Bitcoin in there at the first time. So with that, over to your, your terminal. Right, thank you very much. So what I did last night to set the scene is, before I was working on Katakoda, which is an amazing product, which I love dearly, I was fully immersed into the containers, so everything I deployed was deployed as a container. And so this is the system which I sent MD an IP address to last night. We've got some web app applications in there, we've got some databases, I went full whole hog and even did some like network file system sharing in there. The whole system was containerized. And so let's start with that. It seemed like a good starting place. Okay. So tell right. me, what did you find? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, is this sufficiently visible for those at the back? Okay. Um, right, the format of what we're going to do here... Oh, blimey. Uh, I may downgrade that ever so slightly. Um, Scream if it becomes invisible to you. Uh, that, that seems reasonable-ish, yeah? <coughs> Tentatively. Okay, so, uh, so what we've got here, it's a standard... It's a Linux box, running Tmux, and each individual pane is a different bash shell, and as such, it could be anywhere. It could be on the local host, it could be in a container, it could be on a remote server. We're going to travel to various <laughs> different places. So I'll try and be explicit about where I'm going. Um, apologies if it becomes vaguely confusing. Just also some routine. With any attempt to exploit a system, there are more or less two or three stages. The first is enumerating the external interface that that system presents, in this case to the internet, uh, and penetrating across that security boundary. So that normally takes the, uh, the form of a remote code execution. So that's the application behind the perimeter running code in a context that it shouldn't do. So it's taken something, it's XSS, but on the server side. And then the second part is identifying what privilege is given to the code that we're now able to run from our remote location on that server. And if that is not the root, escalating privilege to the root. And in the case of containers, there's one more step, which is breaking out. Right, so attempting to. Of course, of course. I do apologize. Uh, so we'll start off externally. This is enumerating, uh, in this case, a Samba share. So you can see at the bottom here, we've actually got what's going on. And that is going to come across the top. Uh, it may be cut off for some of them at this resolution. Uh I might just fix that quickly, excuse me, while the curtain is lifted. Um, oh, you're going to see some bash. This is glorious. Uh, so let's call the length. I think we can actually do this. Uh, 
So if you haven't guessed by Andrew's screen, Andrew literally loves Bash. Uh, <laughs> every single project we work on, there are just like awesome Bashness um, floating around, which I just can't comprehend. So I don't know if it's secure or not, but it's um, certainly uh, interesting. So let's play guess the terminal width. Uh, uh, let's, let's just put out 30 characters and see what happens. So, off, whoop, no, we don't quite do that. Uh, and, uh, excuse me. Okay, so, Samba has started somewhere else. Right, there we go. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more narrow than we'd like, but anyway, you get the idea. So the commands that I'm going to run will not only go into the terminal, but also be notified up there in bright red so you can see what's happening. Right, off we go. So we'll start off by using nmap to enumerate for Samba shares running on the environment. And Ben has told us that there are Samba shares around. And that's not quite worked. So let's just... Have a look and see what we can see. So Nmap is originally a network mapping tool, but it has grown far beyond those boundaries and now is essentially the penetration tester's handy pen knife. Swiss Army knife is the phrase, actually. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what we can see is, uh, so we've enumerated possible Samba shares on uh, the interface that we've looked for there, and we've seen there's a few things around. So uh, I happen to have, courtesy of the NSA and Shadow Brokers, a useful Samba exploit. So let's start a container which has the exploit loaded into it. And that exploit is a bit of Python. Again, I have to thank other people for the majority of these things that are being run. Um, importantly, this patches some standard Python libraries in order to inject packets and abuse the Samba protocol. So that, that was the fundament of uh, Samba Cry, WannaCry, NHS busting sort of thing. Uh, let's see, uh, so we're in here, and we can run this exploit, and it doesn't seem to have worked. That is probably because we want to be in here. So just rewinding ever so slightly to run a Docker container, and then pulling up the exploit. There we go, so what's happened here is we have just popped a shell on a Samba server that we shouldn't have been able to do. The nature of this exploit is essentially Samba will accept some modules and dynamic libraries that it should just be putting away into an uh, equivalent to an NFS share. In this case, we've managed to persuade it to run what we've pushed, and that has then popped a reverse shell back to us, and uh, we're now actually on the Samba box. But this is okay, because I'm running everything inside of a container, and you can see that it's running as nobody. So, like... That's not a problem. OK, so what we'll do is we will pop a shell. In fact, let's do that in the same window. We'll, uh, let's get out of here. Excuse me. So we'll go onto a jump box. And this means that we're now on the internet, and we've got a host with an IP address. So that IP address is nice and easily routable. And we will pop, um, we will listen on that IP address and try and force, uh, well, in fact, we don't need to force anything, because in this case, we can easily get an outbound connection from this box. And you see, as soon as I ran that, we have something happening in this window. So I've now SSH securely into a box that I own, listened on a port, and connected from the Samba server into that port. So I'm now happily up on a shell here, running as nobody, but surprisingly, with group root. So at the top, we've got the Samba server. We don't really care about that very much. Oh, look. Oh, hi. <laughs> Did you add that? Is that on my server? No, I'm afraid that's, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> that's a jump box at this point. So now we're into the Samba box. We've got a usable environment because we've got a bash shell that we can actually interact with. And uh, we know who we are. We want to see what does this look like. Sorry, that's the wrong. So there we are. Let's just move those around. And again, we don't care about that really because we've got a persistent shell. So no hub stops the bash process from being killed if the parent process terminates. And it's in a while loop. So if I do something silly like accidentally close down, this and drop the connection, as soon as I bring it back up again, that while loop is still hammering that port, on that, that socket on that server. So uh, we'll just see who are we here. All right, so 4.2, it's a kind of relatively old kernel. And we want to understand what the target server, or in this case, the target Linux something that we're in is doing. 
Wow, PROC 1C group spews a load of information. The important bit here is it says Docker loads of times. So C groups are control groups and namespace for accounts, uh, for resource accounting. And, uh, and this, this suggests to us that we're in a Docker container, unless somebody's configured their C groups this way, which is entirely possible. Have you, Ben? I wouldn't be that mean. Thank Not God. live on stage, anyway. <laughs> OK, so uh, can we make any outbound connections? Uh, there's no curl there, unfortunately. Have we got anything? All right, we've got Python. That's, uh, that's something useful. Python's important. It's a really useful debugging tool for me. <laughs> it's also really useful for me because I've got some horribly malicious scripts written in Python. <laughs> um, I, I've taken effort to uh, obfuscate the URL that I'm coming from there for my safety from you. <laughs> so here we go. That has supposedly pulled down. Let's just move this slightly bigger. Um, pulled down. Oh, no, in fact, so what I've done there is I've declared a bash function called get. Uh, and you can see what it does. It just uses curl, goes to that remote server, chmods the file that I've downloaded, and then runs it. So let's see what's next. Am I contained? Right, so this is a wonderfully useful program from Jesse Frizzell, the, uh, the queen of containers who's recently moved to Microsoft. And what it does is it enumerates the different privilege and control points around a process, so a container, namespaces, C groups, set comp, et cetera. And um, I'm sure it'll come down eventually. Mm -hmm. So here we go. There's some really interesting stuff in here. Container runtime Docker. Thought so, Ben. Told you. The host PID namespace. Well, we don't want to share that because the host PID namespace means that we'd be able to see, if we ran PS, everything running on the host. We want to be in our own namespace for a degree of isolation. Now, there's a few other things here, app armor, user capabilities. But these capabilities here are kernel capabilities. These are what the kernel is supposed to use to constrain a process and only give it the most privileges, sorry, the least privileges that it requires. And there's an awful lot there, Ben. <coughs> yeah, that's OK, isn't it? I'm running as nobody, so like, that should be fine. I don't um, see a problem with yeah. this at all. Well, you're running as nobody, but uh, my favorite privilege of the lot, cap sysadmin. That is carte blanche. Why is uh, that important, Andy? I don't, I don't understand. It's important because this means that this is a privileged container. <coughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I can't imagine it would be. <laughs> I would never win a privileged container. Well, we shall see, young man. We shall see. Uh, right, so uh, now we've got a degree of introspection into what is actually running. Good job, container. Um, well, have a look at the devices that are mounted. That is a lot more devices than we should really be seeing. So if we can mount one of these devices, we can get from the container out to the host. So let's just have a look around. Um, there we go. So we see the ETC host is mapped in devdm0. Docker puts that in place so that you can pass flags on the command line and actually set up your environment with different hosts, for example. But that's how we know the name of the disk that we want. So let's create a temporary mount point, and ah. See, I told you, <sighs> running as nobody, can't get access. I'm All sorry, right. dude, I'm sorry. That Bitcoin is looking quite far over at the back right about now. All right, well, let's see if there's anything else we can do in here. The Linux privilege checker. That sounds like uh, maybe it could do a thing or two. So again, this is the uh, malicious Python script we're talking about. And it will enumerate everything that sits on the file system that we're able to access. So, I mean, permission granted. And uh, oh, look at that. Cap sysadmin. Two exploits in there. But of course, they're in C. We need the GCC compiler or an equivalent on there to actually build those exploits. Or we need something like Metasploit to build them remotely and just inject them in. So we could do that, but it's going to take a while. Metasploit is a bit of a dog to bring up. I wonder what else might be uh, sitting on here. Set user ID binaries, Benjamin. This is very interesting. So uh, set UID is a bit, it's a file attribute set that means I, as a user, when I run this binary, the binary then escalates its privilege to root or whoever actually owns the file in the relevant slot for the permission bit. And if there's a bug in user bin debug, which sounds promising to me, <coughs> then uh, we might be able to exploit that because that's running as root even though we started the process. We can then break out while it's running as root and uh, maybe get a bit further. Okay, 
So uh, what should we do? Uh, user bin debug, let's have a look at that. So, all right, it's running a few things and we can actually see inside what it's running. Dear, oh dear. Um, can we page in here? We can't actually, so just copy and paste that. And so this is a list of all the text strings that the strings program thinks it can, side, can find inside the ELF binary. And uh, if we have a quick look through here, ooh, tempsuid.sh. Do you recognize <coughs> this, Ben? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's one of my debug tools, which I use internally. Um, it's really, really helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't, you wasn't supposed to find that quite so quickly. Well, let's hope it's, uh, its helpfulness extends all the way to me. So let's just see what's in that file. Uh, some examples of user groups. And we can drop something on the end of there that spawns a shell for us, and then we run it, and ah, we rooted the container. Okay, okay, fair enough, all right. Um, okay, so what does that mean for my pure little system? Well, we're um, still in a container, which is a good thing, but root inside a container is reaching parity with root on the host system. I mean, user groups are super important. User namespaces aren't even on by default, and user namespaces version two are required to ship in the kernel before we've really got security around users in containers. So uh, I wonder if I can remount the host file system from inside the container. That would be <coughs> exciting. <coughs> that, that would seem like something sensible. Um, yeah, give it a go and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've created this mount point already. We know that dev dm0 is where we want to be. And hello, no errors. So what is now mounted in temp host? Looks like a root file system. Sweet Jesus. <coughs> and that actually looks like the actual root as well. Um, we've got some lovely, uh, interesting directories in there, like code, for example. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, this looks like. <laughs> um, it actually looks a lot like the provision script for this VM has not put a Bitcoin in the root directory where it's supposed to be. But let's just accept the fact that there was well, a Bitcoin Andrew, there once. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, running a privileged container would have been a little bit too easy for you, um, wouldn't it? it? Um, I have to make you work for this Bitcoin. <gasps> I think I found it. I think I found it, Ben. Let's just have a look. So if it's in temp host from inside the container, then we're mounted into root. In fact, we're not. Hold on. We've mounted it like this. Happy days. <sighs> Private key part the first. Indeed. Um, so you have successfully managed to get part of the private key. So well done. Congratulations, Andrew. <laughs> um, this kind of goes to show that running privileged containers is not super smart, even if you have locked down the user. Um, but as we know, I'm sure some of us are aware with Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin comes in multiple kind of two parts. We have a public key, which is your wallet. Um, and that's where people will send you lovely Bitcoins to. And then we have private keys, which actually keep that wallet secure and make sure that people can't go in and um, extract all the Bitcoin from your wallet, which is what Andrew is lovely trying to do today. But the problem is, I kind of thought about this, and I know that private keys are somewhat sensitive, and I kind of followed what other people do. So I broke up my big, long private key into multiple different parts. Very sensible. Indeed. Um, so we have successfully managed to break out this one, privileged, easy. But this was back in the days before Katakoda, and I've learned a few things oh since running on Katakoda. So if you uh, would like to flip to your web browser, because I can't use your laptop, <laughs> <laughs> and it somewhat slightly scares me after all of that Basque command stuff, to be as honest as well. So what I've done is I have deployed a brand new system, um, some new functionality for Katakoda. Um, it's all running. Um, there, we've got some load balancers happening in front of it, and then behind that, we've got the application because I'm thinking about scaling, mm. because trust me, this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> so, with that in mind, um, I've kind of learned some lessons from before. I don't do things like running in privileged containers anymore, at least I hope I don't. Um, but why don't you have a little poke around and see now what you can find. Now we've got kind of like a more modern, kind of like a custom version of deploying applications following some certain best practices. Okay, all right. So we've got a load balancer, and uh, all we have, 
right, we could do with, oh, hello. Need some of that at least. Um, all we have is the public API. So let's see what we can find. Um, first of all, we want to set the host. Oh, that's not quite right. The host to wherever it is that we are. Um, and again, Nmap is our friend in enumerating targets. It can do almost everything. Um, so let's just make sure that things are up. Uh, host seems down. Excellent. Let's just change that to an actual host name and try again. Excuse me, that way. That's a bit more like it. Um, this is all going through a custom highlight script, of course, just to try and pull out things that are visually useful instead of the whiteout that normally is a shell. Um, and that looks, uh, looks like TCP 443 is open. So we've got Nginx running there. Now, Nginx is a web server. They normally have a pretty secure perimeter. I wonder what we can do. Well, I mean, again, happy days. Nmap provides us with a lot of options here. And had we an infinite quantity of time, then we could use all of the enumeration scripts that Nmap provides and just run through the lot. Um, I've got my suspicions, though, Ben, because uh, I know you just pull images off the Docker Hub. I would never do that. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't think you go to the tab that says this number of vulnerabilities, and I don't think you pull containers regularly to make sure we get security updates. So uh, I don't know, but I'm getting pretty nervous. I've had to take off my hoodie, so. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to hedge my bets here, and I'm going to try the shell shock vulnerability enumeration. Shell shock was really old. It, it is a bit old, isn't it? I mean, you would have thought everyone would be patched by now. I wonder what Nmap will tell us. Service scan. My, my, my. <laughs> if it isn't a little bit of shell shock. So, uh, so what we have here is Nmap doing the business. First of all, it's just again enumerated the host. Uh, well, in fact, it's no enumeration. It's just we've told it which port to go to. And then it's had a poke around, and it's discovered there is some shell shock ability in this host. So I mean, we could just continue to use Nmap and pass a load of configuration flags, but I love Bash. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this properly. So uh, what is Shellshock? Well, you may well ask. It is a weird looking exploit. And uh, what it actually does, oh, that doesn't work properly. Hold on, let's get back. Um, what it actually does here, let's leave it up slightly. Oh, uh, well, fine. I'm just gonna have to drop backs and forwards, sorry. Yeah, so you can see here, it's defined user agent, and then those six or seven characters are just bash. So the function declaration in parentheses, then the curly braces actually define the content of the function, then you've got a colon and semicolon, which is no op. That's just there to confuse the bash parser. What you pass after that then gets executed in the context of the user the web server is running as. This is dreamy for a penetration <laughs> tester. Not, not so much for me, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. OK. Does that look a little bit like your ETC password file, Ben? Um, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It's um, <laughs> running inside of a container, literally, these are just default. There's nothing to see here, just move along, carry on. OK. <laughs> well, I mean, you make a couple of good points. Of course, the passwords are in a shadow file. Even if we extracted that, we'd have to run some horrible, huge rainbow table, the tack to actually get the reverse of those hashes. So we know some user accounts are on the system. Not much more has actually happened here. Um, what else can we do? I wonder, I wonder if there's a Docker socket available in here. Hello, hello, hello. So the Docker socket mounted inside the container. Does that have a legitimate use, Ben? The Docker socket is super important for me. It's a load balancer, and everything's deployed as a container. But for my load balancer, it needs to know where to send traffic. And so it needs to look at what other containers are there on my system. And so you'll see this in various different places. Um, serverless, for example, take advantage of this. Um, Nginx proxy, um, and so it uses that, uses the Docker socket to talk to the host, and then it can find out where it needs to send the traffic. I think this is perfectly legitimate um, scenario, and I, I need it, I need it, I'm well, sorry. It, it does sound reasonable, and I know that the uh, Docker Nginx proxy um, 
Let's Encrypt Companion will actually increase Layer 7 security by generating free TLS certificates, but at what cost? <laughs> okay, so let's see what else we can do. Now we've got the Docker socket. First of all, let's pull the Docker client. Okay, now because we're coming through a weird pseudo terminal, we don't actually get a proper update of this, but we hope that that's pulled. There we go, three seconds. Um, let's see if we can run that. Right, so we've managed to get the Docker version, but notably, that is only the client. Yeah, now that see? suggests... So you can't talk to the server, so I don't think there is a problem here. I think this is just a... I'm just leading you down the wrong path, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Well, it's, it's hard to take, Ben. Um, <laughs> <sighs> let's, let's see if there's anything else we can do here. I mean, who are we at this point? In triple dub data. I wonder if he's got pseudo permissions. Oh, lovely, jubbly. <coughs> Another misconfiguration. Sorry, but like, pseudo is important. I need it, again, for debugging purposes. Um, and I thought that would be the best way to keep it in. I didn't think there would be a problem. Um, and so, I, so how have you managed to actually access my Docker host from there? Um, with the Docker socket mounted into the container from the host, then the same control is then afforded to any client of that Docker socket, which is just an inter-process communications pipe, as it would be if you were sitting on the host running Docker. Um, so we've pulled the client, we've run it with elevated privileges that were given to us for free in this instance, and we're now able to perform actions on the host because obviously running Docker is essentially root privileges on the host. All right, so what else can we do now? <sighs> we, can, we can run a container from inside the container that we're on but of course it's talking to the socket on the host that then mounts the host file system again and uh, we'll see if Ben has made the same mistake twice. Oh, let's go up a couple, here we are. And there we go. I mean, it doesn't see, look... I'm, like there's no Bitcoins there, dude. Ah. I have told you I've learned my lesson. I'm not gonna make the same mistake twice, touch words, anyway. Okay, well, I mean, while we're here, we'll just leave a friendly reminder for the sysadmin that binds <coughs> mounted root sockets are dangerous. <coughs> so I, will, um, I will appreciate that next time I log into the server. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, the other places you can store data, perhaps doc volumes? I wonder if there's, if there's one of those knocking around on the server. Let's, let's have a look. Hello, hello, hello. What's Look, going Docker on? volumes are awesome. Um, <laughs> and they're a great place to store data, um, as, you, as you can see. Um, I, I'll grant you that, but uh, it looks in this case as if the security model is not sufficient to hold the data inside it. Yes, indeed, indeed. It also looks suspiciously as if there is no Bitcoin in <laughs> the Bitcoin volume. So this is a prime example of things that Control Plane does. And yes. <laughs> um, we, we shall take this one as red, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen. Um, at this stage, there, there was likely to be that, but I'm afraid it's not there. Okay. So moving quickly on as we're running very short on time. So um, which part of the system do you want to exercise next? My beautiful new application? Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I so mean, what have you got? Like, let's see what's behind the... Uh, load balancer. So let's assume we'll discuss about how we're going to fix this in a moment, but let's kind of push forward because um, I really want to show you what's, what's there and hope it's still there. Look, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. I think this is going to transform the, uh, how Katakoda works and people <laughs> like Michael will love me for it. Um, I, it looks really quite beautiful. The pinnacle of web design. <laughs> I, I, put my, I, I put, spent a long time on that CSS. Thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so again, we have got an, uh, an external interface into the system. And at this point, we kind of don't really know much. We could use Nmap again, but we've done that. So, I mean, wh what else can we do? Let's try and identify what the server behind it is and maybe see what uh, modern web technology Ben has chosen. Uh, so, is it just an HTML page? It's not. Um, but why would you run Apache in this day and age unless PHP? <laughs> <laughs> PHP is an awesome language. Like hey, certain companies have made a lot of money by writing their system in PHP, and I, I'm just hoping that will pay off for me. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, let's make sure we've got the correct host URL here. Now that we know this is PHP, um, and it's a mail form, and it 
just so happens that I seem to recall there was a CVE raised against PHP Mailer quite <laughs> recently. Yeah, the chances of that are pretty, pretty high. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, fortune has converged upon us at this place and time. So uh, let's... Is that actually the right host? Let's make sure. Sim birds on two. Sim four, not quite. Okay. So we set the host again just to be fed into further bash scripts here. And uh, I happen to have a handy pre-prepared exploit. So this is very simple. Um, it is just, well, look at that. That was a very quick remote code execution. So <laughs> A little bit too quick for my life. <laughs> yeah. But that's good because we're running mass massively out of time. We are indeed. <laughs> so moving at a slightly a quicker pace, uh, what we have here is another remote code execution. So we have sent code through into that email form that PHP, as we know, it interpolates executables in its brackets. It hasn't parsed that properly. It's accidentally written it to a log file. It's also been able to rename that log file because we've been executing PHP code inside those brackets, and we've now created a backdoor. So when we send data to that backdoor, it shells out and it runs the command that we've just sent. So what commands shall we send? Well, first of all, C groups, hello, we're in Kubernetes this time. So we've got a lot of the same security models as we would have for Docker, but they're not quite as tuned. They're not, they haven't been deployed for as long. Some of the security extensions are not quite so hot. I mean, I hope you've configured this properly then. I've, I'm sure I have, but please, Mr. Certified Kubernetes <laughs> Administrator, do, do tell me. Thank you so much. Um, you'll notice I haven't taken the exam yet, so I can't claim that. Like myself. So uh, one of the most confounding factors of Kubernetes development was being based on Borg, wonderful distributed systems, kept our searches flowing for a decade or more. They mount a service token into every pod. Now, this is ostensibly to allow any pod to act as an actor on behalf of the user, so to interact with an API to maybe be an operator in the first uh, instance of, of that, the first iteration of, of that particular um, entity. However, up until Kubernetes 1.6, that default service token was carte blanche, essentially system administrator, the cap sys admin of Kubernetes. So hopefully, there's one in this container. And that looks a lot like a set of certificates. Uh, potentially, yes. Um, I wasn't quite aware of the dangers of the service account uh, access. So yeah, may have, may have forgotten to turn that one off. Well, it's easily done. The official recommendations by some projects were actually to disable it when it launched in 1.6 and to fall back to um, ABAC instead of uh, the role-based access control. So this is the contents. We don't know what name, uh, sorry, we know what namespace, but not what user we're in by default. This is um, an obfuscated key that has no uh, semblance of reality in terms of um, cryptography, but we can see a cert here, which is, that's a standard PKI sort of thing. We know what that is. So. Uh, what can we do without, without the cube control binary, we can do some strange reverse backflips and actually fire off direct API commands, but pff, that's a lot of effort. So, uh, oh, we don't have wget in here. Well, I have, I've told you, I locked down the container. I've moved anything which isn't required, such as wget, curl, all of the things which I would assume that you're going to try and yeah. use. Yeah, well, that's very sensible. Um, but I wonder if we've got any runtimes like we did before. And PHP is there. <laughs> so what can we do? We can write a one-line PHP application to emulate curl for us. Lovely, jubbly, and there it is. Uh, so, I mean, you'll see from here, it, it's, all, uh, it's all a bit bizarre. But passing the command line, and there is Kubernetes. Sweet. OK, so we've now got the Kubernetes um, client downloaded to that re remote server. Let's just go back to service count. Those are all the things we want. This is the mother of all one-liners, which is, uh, <laughs> which is um, actually configuring. Because, of course, we can't write to wherever we want inside this container. A lot of the file system mount points are immutable, but temp is almost always left openly writable. So what we can do here with this uh, beautiful bit of code uh, is just pass loads of flags to the Kubernetes as uh, the kube control config. That will write all those out in the kube config file. And if that pauses, there we go. So we've now managed to configure a kube config file based on the service count tokens that were just lying around. Yeah, <laughs> just ha <laughs> handily for you, <laughs> it's, uh, as, as they if, are. <laughs> as if by magic. Um, so kube control version, sweet. So that is client and server versions reported. 
we have API access. So what can we do with this now that we're inside a cube pod with access to the master, to the API? Um, well, we can check what nodes are there. I hope there's one or two, lovely jubbly. 175, so we're past the point that RBAC has landed. These probably should be configured then. Uh, yeah, but I haven't quite read the documentation on RBAC yet, and suddenly there isn't any catacoda scenarios on RBAC. So oh, like, I see. Like, this is the problem. So I need to get, I need to get onto this because I'm seeing the dangers <laughs> of uh, having these service count tokens lying around and the lack of RBAC. Well, glad to be of service. So routing the kubelet port also if insecure. So if you don't have TLS between your kubelets, that's another escalation point. You can just make API calls to those and fire them around again with the, uh, with the service token. So let's just have a quick look at the cluster info. There's a few things going on there. The service counts. So this is the guilty party that we are running. Um, but there's Bitcoin here somewhere, hopefully. Let's have a look. So what have we got? Well, I mean, in addition to the bootstrap token, so we could just add extra nodes if we wanted to, a weirdly malicious but helpful action. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's pull this Bitcoin. Another one liner. What do we have? Lovely, jubbly. Of course, I'm piping all my shell output to a temporary file, so I don't need to save this anywhere. But that leaves us. But that would look like the, uh, an, extra, an extra part, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. So uh, yes. th there's one remaining. Ah, but I don't think we have time for that. One minute and 48 seconds over. Yeah, I think, I think you're just going to have to call it a day, dude. Well, this is a great shame because the best was yet to come, naturally. <laughs> uh, we've demonstrated the majority of we wanted, what we wanted to show you. Um, latter would have been a dirty cow kernel breakout. I've demonstrated this a lot of times this year, so if you're really desperate to see it, you can it's, just go on to on Twitter. Uh, yeah, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. It's fine. around. <laughs> um, but aren't you somewhat frustrated right about now that you can't do anything more? Uh, well, uh, that would be <laughs> that would be what I would do. So yes, deeply frustrated. But of course, five more minutes, you say? <gasps> Wonderful. Well, in that case, now I've ruined the surprise. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. So of course, the fix for this is uh, is RBAC 1.6 plus. Cluster role bindings and cluster roles should be applied to everything that you do. It's absolutely paramount because, of course, what Kubernetes is defending against is not an internal malicious administrator, which is a very difficult thing to defend against anyway. It's application code. Having a vulnerability is the thing that changes most often and the most likely route to exploitation. Somebody getting into your application and getting into a pod and then escalating from there. So, um, onwards. Right, what do we have here? So at this point, we are sitting in a pod. We don't have root, but we'd like to have root. Um, we'd like to get onto the node and at that point, take over the box, look for other secrets. Um, we, we do have a lot of control here, so it's only a minor escalation. But again, this, uh, this funky one-liner will just pull. Um, in this case, what you can't see is, uh, hello, what's going on here? That is in the wrong window. So give me a second. So, oh, hello, so we need to set the host to. Please excuse me. So we'll break out of there, pull the same host that we were using. And we've just popped into a different window because uh, my script is at the bottom of this one. So off we go. We've pasted in the same host name. We are running the same exploit. The back door has already been placed by the previous run through of that exploit, and we are back in. And we should also have the correct um, Kubernetes token. Let's see where I just put these. Lovely jubbly. OK, so now we're again using this, um, oh, slow that down, excuse me, uh, this contrived wget function to get around the fact that there's nothing actually installed on the box that we want. And we're pulling down the Linux exploit suggester. So this is checking for the kernel version and checking for all the CVEs raised against that version. Dirty cow, my absolute favorite. Um, so what we'll do here is just make sure, uh, one thing, there is no guarantee that because a kernel reports a specific version, that A, it's that version, or B, it's that patch level. And as is the case with some things, so sort of earth-shaking is Dirty Cow, which affected all Linux kernels for the last 10 years or so, every single branch line gets patched. So you can't always be sure. Um, in this case, we'll just 
because we can pull and run containers, we can run this test container. And let's just see if it agrees with us that we are vulnerable. So dirty cow is a kernel bug. And the reason that kernel bugs are so dangerous is because Docker shares the kernel between every host, uh, sorry, between every um, Docker container on the host. This differs from a virtual machine, which uses a hypervisor to emulate the BIOS and the full system boot for every virtual machine that you run. It's a different security model. When you understand the risks and you still get the incredible speed of containers and the joy of immutable deployments, well, we kind of prefer containers in general, I presume. Oh, look, we, we are vulnerable. Uh, no, so it's what, if you read this, then um, the test for Dirty Cow, we're writing your safe to a file, we're then trying to run it, then we're running Dirty Cow foo, you are vulnerable, and then seeing what foo is set to. So during that two seconds of sleep, Dirty Cow runs, it does an M advised call against the kernel, where it's basically trying to map a bit of memory and exploiting a race condition in copy on write code. This is worth reading about because it's only a breakneck example. Um, and that sleep too is the time in which Dirty Cow, which is a background process, you can see by the ampersand, is running, and then we cat the value of foo. You are vulnerable was written by Dirty Cow to that file. Consequently, so this is sounding pretty dangerous at the moment for me <laughs> and for my system. If you've managed to break out the containers, even though all of the permissions are there, um, I'm a little bit concerned. So I'm just going to go ahead and on my phone uh, <coughs> deploy the updates. So I'm going to enable RBAC, as you recommended, so you don't have the service Very account. Sensible. So then you can't download any stuff. I'm also going to um, apply SEPCOMP and AppArmor. So SEPCOMP allows us to filter what commands are actually being executed and by certain applications. And as such, we can filter out some of the exploits and some of the system calls that Dirt Cloud requires. As that will kind of like successfully <sighs> save my system, eventually I'll schedule like a kernel upgrade and actually do it properly. <laughs> but in the meantime, this will stop you in your tracks. OK, well, that frustrates me deeply. And as a vindictive child, age 15, <laughs> I will use this wonderful little bit of bash you may recognize it as a fork bomb. This is designed to exhaust the resources of a system. Again, it looks a little bit like you see the shell shock vulnerability. Uh, you're declaring a function, but very importantly, you declare the function as a semi as a colon, and run the function, pipe it to itself, put it into the background, and you can imagine that then recursively forks off an infinite number of processes pending the full capacity of the system. Um, right, Ben. You frustrated me, and I am. Are you? Ooh. <laughs> Excuse me. Ah, uh, thwarted by your own skills. Oh, devastating. Uh, fortunately, the backdoor is persistent. In we go, and this fork bomb um, will now cause unlimited damage to this particular run yeah, of that server. Fork bombs are somewhat frustrating because literally that's now game over for my server and the entire of everything running on it, which is unfortunate. So there's some ways that we can protect against people like Andrew, who just want to be <laughs> malicious and take it down. If you're running Docker and running a later version of kernel, you can apply a PID limit. So you can apply a limit based on how many processes should be running within that container. Unfortunately, with Kubernetes, I'm kind of, I don't have the functionality yet until 1.8 is deployed. So I'm going to have to wait on that. So that's why you managed to um, take it out. But fortunately, in the future, I will be able to protect against that. But there's some, something else, Andrew. So as you've been doing this, I've been occasionally getting some alerts um, on my phone, really? obviously from all the people saying how amazing our talk is, <laughs> um, but also some alerts based on my uh, intrusion detection system. Uh -oh. I'm not just going to let you hack my system and, um, and steal everything, am I? So I've been using things like Fistic Falcon, Twistlock, Acro, all of these um, monitoring tools to alert me about what's going on. And you should really start using a VPN a little bit more successfully, because you left um, your IP I, address just I, randomly uh, open so that anyone could trace it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so next time you look in your Bitcoin wallet, you may find it slightly less than what it is, because I've used your own tricks against you. Uh, uh, I know, it's awful and terrible. But <laughs> if we go back to the slides... You won't go back to the slides. I won't go back to the slides. No, no, you won't get laptop. No, no, at all. I was too ambitious. <laughs> and go to the next one. So if you don't want to have some of the vulnerabilities which Andrew um, kind of kindly exploited and showed me um, all of the gaps, and you, he can show you too with his awesome control plane company. <laughs> um, these are some of the tips which we kind of put together and kind of would have stopped Andrew in his tracks. So firstly, you don't want to run things like privileged containers. They are not contained. So if you are running that, 
basically all of the things which Docker does to protect you are simply removed. So you don't want that. So the flag called no new privileges. And so this was blocked Andrew from going from nobody to being a root user. And it blocks that set UID that Andrew managed to utilize in order to exploit and break out um, and then mount the host. It's important to remember that the docket socket, socket file is somewhat sensitive. And if you do get access to that because it's on a front-facing server, because we've got things like Shellshock or a future version of Shellshock, then people will be able to launch containers. And that obviously gives them open up to everything, including all of our Bitcoin. Now, as you're running and pushing forward and looking at things like Kubernetes, there is so many security features now, it's awesome. So we've got things like role-based access con con control. So you can limit what people can do and how people can interact, making sure that you're defining barriers and defenses against different parts of my system. So in this case, just because Andrew managed to break out or break into one part, he wouldn't have then managed to access my secrets and other things because I would have collectively secured the server. And there's other things like monitoring and security tooling, um, and making sure that um, if things do happen, you're raising alerts and there's things in the system watching to make sure that things don't go amiss and you don't have people opening up reverse shells and um, managing the system rem remotely without you even being aware. But fundamentally, all of this could have been stopped. My system could have been secure, and Andrew wouldn't have got managed to get all of the Bitcoins, or at least part of them, if, one, I applied updates. Pretty <laughs> obvious, really, but you never know. Um, and then also run tools like Docker Bench and Kubernetes Bench. Both of these will run security audits on your system and making sure that they are applied, they are everything on your system is running correctly, running um, according to their best practices. And this would have highlighted all of the mistakes above. And then I could have protected myself and protected my systems. And Andrew would never have managed to do what he did. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I think Andrew would also like to thank you. Very much so. Um, and if you have any questions, we'll be around for some drinks later on. And uh, with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, who would have thought?